Hey everyone and welcome to episode one of I'm Recruitable TV. My name is Tarek Merchant and I'm the founder and director at I'm Recruitable and alongside my co-host is John Sklenar, part of the I'm Recruitable team. The sidekick. So, I've known Tarek for 20 years and I've been saying his name wrong for 20 years. That's all right. Um, we, we've known each other for a long time, grew up together in Canada, played college sports together, and now we are helping athletes navigate the process. And um, the whole concept of I'm Recruitable TV is to give parents, athletes, coaches, college coaches, everybody, an opportunity to learn more about the process and to give real advice. We realized over the years that there's so many resources out there, but many are outdated. Many have biased opinions. Uh, some people, frankly, don't even know exactly what they're talking about, or you know, there's there's just a lot of confusion in the space. And what happens is that um, it actually makes the athletes uh, more confused. They don't understand what to do. So we're here with I'm Recruitable TV to give you unbiased, real advice, no BS. And we're coming at you with different topics, and there's no order in it. We're just going to discuss various topics as we think about them. And hopefully, you know, once or twice a week, um, we'll give you guys content and see where this takes us. We believe this is the first of this kind of show, and um, we want to make a difference for athletes, not only help people through the recruitment process, but also make sure that they have a great and rewarding student athlete experience that they earn a great degree and then they use their network and their experiences and opportunities that they got in college to the real world, great jobs, become future leaders of, of uh, tomorrow. So all of that being said, our first episode is going to talk about contacting college coaches and uh, we're excited to help educate you guys here. So John, take it away. Yeah, let's get going here. So when, uh, when can you contact, uh, college coaches well it's never too early to contact them um, I would say even beginning eighth grade ninth grade usually as far as contacting them um, it never hurts going that early because college coaches can put you on their radar so college coaches have like their own timelines and there's obviously rules with NCAA on when they can approach like a prospect or call them um, Tarek will give you some information where you can go get those dates. Uh, as far as the schools, they can send you brochures and information about the colleges, universities at any time. But if if you're trying to get recruited, the earlier the better. Again, coaches will keep you on their radar. They can see your development and they kind of get to know you better. And then when you can start actually communicating with them, they'll already know who you are. Yeah, that makes a really good point. So I think like a lot of times parents say, well, my kid's too young, you know, you're in grade nine, and we don't know. So, uh, you know, if it, it depends where people are at, right? Like, if you're a competitive athlete, you're quite certain you want to play in college and that you play your sport um, regularly, it doesn't hurt to get on the coach's radar, as you said, because coaches start building lists early on, they want to know who is out there, and they'll track you sometimes for two, three, four years. And it, it definitely depends on the sport. It definitely depends on the uh, division and or, or place where you're going to go. But as John said, it doesn't hurt, right? Like to get um, in front of these coaches. If you decide at some point later on that you don't want to play your sport in college, well, then that's fine. Like you're, you know, you, you didn't lose anything. But the problem is that if you decide to get on a coach's radar later, and sometimes you become too late then you've actually lost opportunities. So there's nothing wrong with doing it first, um, you know, early on. And then if you decide that you don't want to play, that's fine. But doing it the other way around where you just contact them when you feel like you're ready, which will often happen to athletes as, as far as going into their senior year, well, you can be too late. And, you know, there's different reasons for that that we'll get into in different episodes. But um, yeah, I think well, that's one really more thing here also, like a coach – as you know, Tarek, uh, they like to know their recruits as much as possible, right? Yeah. So if, so if a coach has been following you for four years now, they obviously have a tremendous relationship with you. They know exactly who you are. They're going to be comfortable bringing you on their team for the four years that you're going to be there. 
rather than, you know, knowing you, you know, just for a short period of time, I would say, you know, it just gives them more of a chance to get on the team as well. Yeah. So the NCAA.org has recently come out with this great guide for college bound student athletes. It's a PDF. And for the first time, the NCAA has really put, I believe, a really strong effort into explaining uh, basically a, a, a step by step um, guide to, to recruiting, which gives you the important information, the important dates. It's laid out very nicely. It definitely helps people like us to understand what those rules are in place. And as far as a communication goes, on one of the pages, you can go to the recruiting calendar and you can see the different uh, times when you can communicate with coaches, which actually is any time, versus when coaches can communicate with you on the phones, by email, or any other type of text messaging, and then in-person communications. And they vary football, basketball, some other sports like ice hockey, and then there's all other sports. So you can go online and figure that out. The other thing that we can bring up is um, going to like exposure camps or prospect camps or showcases. So the prospect camps and those exposure camps that are around for different sports, um, they often allow eighth graders and onward to come. And at those events, if the coaches are coaching those camps, you're allowed to interact with them. You're not talking recruiting because you're not talking recruiting anyways. You're not at a point where they can even offer you anything, but you are able to communicate and build relationships and get to know those coaches, which is very, very beneficial. So those are great opportunities for everybody. And um, that's how you, know, you can get in contact with coaches early on. So we're moving on to the next one here, which is getting coaches contact information. So really like before you can start can, like the recruiting process of contacting these coaches, you have to get their contact information, right? So um, there's many, many ways to do that. Nowadays, you have a lot of online platforms um, that provide you with a directory of college coaches um, instead of manually doing it. The old way of going on to each athletic website, you can still do that, but you want to contact a lot of coaches and then narrow down your list. So it is tedious, probably the less um, you know, productive way now, nowadays with technology and databases. So I would recommend that athletes use the databases that are available because they're up to date. But if you are going online then uh, and you're uh, searching an athletic website, so let's just say you went on to like Stanford, um, athletic website, a lot of these schools don't just have the coach's information right underneath the sport. There's a trick to that. You have to go to the directories column, go to inside athletics, and then you can find these college coaches. So sometimes people struggle with that too, but that is a trick and that's how you get the job done. Um, you also want to make sure that you get all the coaches on the staff information. You don't just want to grab the head coach or the assistant coach. You want to grab everybody on the staff. Now, you may not know who's doing the recruiting. Maybe it's everyone from your coaching staff. Maybe it's one person, the assistant coach or the head or a specific scout, depending like football, for example, will have more coaches generally. And if they do, they might even have one coach that's dedicated to <clears throat> recruitment. But you want to email your first contact. You want to send them a message to everybody. So whoever's in charge, whether it's one or more people, they have your information. So the next thing is how do you initiate the first contact now, right? So, John, I'll let you start that off if you want. Yeah, the first contact, I mean, like you were saying, I would email, you know, the coaches, assistant coaches, associate coaches, whoever's on the team there that you can email that has an email address. Send them an intro email about yourself and always follow up with a call. Um, when it comes to emails, I always recommend uh, responding to all emails or recruiting letters that you get from coaches even if you don't have interest in the school, it's kind of just out of a respect factor. Also, coaches tend to talk to other coaches and coaches can also recommend you to other coaches. Uh, personal example myself, I went to a school in New Mexico. 
never reached out to this school in New Mexico when I was going to college. Um, but there was a coach out in Tennessee that went to a coach's conference meeting and he, you know, his roster was full and he ended up passing my information over to the coach in New Mexico. And that's how I made my connection. And I ended up going there for four years. So things like this happen in the, in the college world. Yeah. It's a small world, right? Like no matter what sport you play, Coaches know each other. People talk. It's so crazy how quickly uh, names get passed around right. amongst coaches. And like, it's really hard for a college coach to keep a player a secret nowadays. They want to. And how many times have we heard that from coaches in the past? And then they'll be like, well, I know about this kid from Latvia or whatever. Nobody else knows about it. Time. You know, somebody else mentions to you, hey, I found out about this kid. Don't tell anyone. You're like, well, five other guys already know him. So exactly. um, it's important to, it's important, I think, to know uh, the, the two types that you were mentioning, John, is like, one thing is initiating contact. And I want to bring this up. Um, I've, over the years, I've had parents come up to me, and even athletes, who say, you know, I, I don't, you know, I'm not supposed to go after the coach, the coach is supposed to go after me. The problem is that that happens to your 1% or your 10%, however way you want to look at it the top, top players in each sport are going to get sought after, right? So if you're the LeBron James of basketball or you're the, you know, Tiger Woods of golf or the Roger Federer of tennis, like, of course, every single coach is going to know who you are and go after you because you're the best player or one of the top players in the country or in the world. So that's different. That only happens to a handful of kids. Now, everybody else has to initiate contact. That just is what it is, right? So we can argue all day or we can feel emotional about it and say, well, I want to get sought after. Well, it's not that the coach isn't interested in you. It's just, that's how it works. They can't go after, they're, they're going to go after hundred, 200 plus kids. You're going to go after coaches as well. And you can't wait for them to come to you, especially if coaches are in a position where they're, um, getting a lot of interest from other players, right? Like exactly. what, then what separates you? You're trying to be one of those players that gets the spot. You're competing against everyone else, unless you're that top player for that team, they're going to recruit you regardless. So I think it's important to understand that they have to initiate and email is the best way to still do that. People, um, We'll try various things. I don't think it's anything wrong with, you know, if a coach is on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or wherever you're online to send them a message, but you're going to need to give them a certain amount of information that we're going to talk about now. Um, but email is the formal way to do so. And, um, and you know, personalize your email. So, yeah. you know, a lot of coaches, I talk to coaches all the time and the email that they're going to miss or the email that they might just hit a delete on is the ones where they can tell that, you know, the prospect has, or the recruit has, you know, put in a hundred other coaches in the BCC line and just hit that send button. And they're all getting the exact same message. How many times do we talk to coaches, Tarek? And they're like, God, I hate that. Like, I just wish, you know, let the recruit introduce themselves. I want it to be personalized towards me and my program and that's something that sparks their interest. And then that's when that's when the conversation can start. Yeah. And let's be so let's be real on that. That's a, that's a good thing you brought up is. Yes, you need to personalize emails because you should be hitting a list of schools that you realistically fit at. Your target list should be schools that could be a potential fit for you academically, athletically, financially, etc. And so you should be able to make a connection. Hey, I won't coach. I'd like to come to XYZ school because of this, this, this. I've done my research. I think I can fit. I think I can play for you. This is where I want to be. Um, at the same time, you're, you're going to be going after a number of schools, right? right? And there's a chance that you make a mistake. But coaches on their side, they got an ego in the sense they want to feel wanted. At the same time, would you want a coach to write you and say, hey, Jimmy, when your name's John? No, right. because now it looks like he's sending out or she's sending out a mass email. And it kind of happens. We do mass email, right? There's nothing wrong with bulk messaging, but you have to do it where you're conscious about taking the template, but 
personalizing it and adding a couple lines at the beginning, you know, there are some kids that might just not know where they end are supposed to go and what they're going to do. Well, they're going to go ahead and maybe just throw a bunch of feelers out. Right. But for the majority of coaches and majority of players, you're going to want to personalize it, make sure you pay attention to that detail. So you give the good feeling off. No, because nobody's hiding that we that you're going out to a number of schools. No, of and course nobody, not. You know, no one's hiding on the coach's side. Uh, they may not tell you, but they're going out to a number of players too. Right. So make people feel good. The, Another good, another tip I think is, is the parent side. Um, John, should parents be emailing coaches? No, they should not be. Again, when it, when it, yeah, big X on that. Um, when it comes to, again, like I was saying before, coaches trying to find a student athlete that can be on their team for four years, get along with the coach, get along with the team and, you know, enjoy the college experience and go on in life. So at the end of the day, even speaking with parents, it's like, this is where the student athlete needs to stay engaged. They need to show interest to the coaches. Coaches don't want to see all the interest coming from the parent or from agencies even. They want to be speaking with the student athlete. They want to get to know the student athlete. They want to know that the student athlete is interested. This is a make or break when it comes to being able to get on a team. You know, at times, you know, you could be a, at a specific level, okay? And, uh, you know, if a coach has a decision between two players, okay, one is at a slighter, higher level, let's say, than the other, it doesn't mean you're out of the race. The, the lower level, athlete can be the one getting on the team just because of the personality they had because of their social life they have or because how they get along with the team or how they got along with the coach so there's a lot more to the recruiting process than just you know your athletic ability i yeah. would say when it comes down to that if i'm sure you would agree with that yeah 100 percent. i mean it's it's a student athlete that needs to drive the process because like you said, they're going to be the ones going to school. That's who the coach wants to build a relationship with. And we get caught up in the whole part of the process. So like I got to send an email out. I got to impress the coach. I mean, there's two ways to do it. You can have someone else do it for you. Your parents can do it for you or you can do it yourself. And as you said, it, you, there's not one coach in the country that if you honestly asked, them, who do you want to hear from, will not say the student athlete. Who do you want to build a relationship? They will not say anybody but the student athlete. Mm -hmm. They may not say it necessarily to everyone's face because they might want to please a parent. Like, so again, no BS right here, no filter. If you're a top prospect and we ask that question and you're going to go play, you know, be a superstar for that team, the coach is going to, and the parent's been initiating. If I ask in front of them, they'll be like, oh, well, you know, it's fine if the parent says this only because they want that top prospect. But if there was no, nothing involved, there was no other, you know, factors involved, they would all say the athlete. And so our job as, you know, uh, advisors, consultants, um, experts, uh, parents, cheerleaders, whatever you want to call it, our job is to make sure that these athletes have the skills and we give them the information they need to go and communicate well with these coaches. And so when a coach gets an email from an athlete, but it sounds like a 46 year old dad and not a 16 year old kid. I mean, it's, you're not fooling anybody. Like we all no. seen it before, you know, it's not written like a 16 or 17 year old kid and no. coaches see right through it. They don't mind if it sounds like a 16, 17 year old kid, because that's what, who they're going to be dealing with for four years. I mean, parents need to support. Different. Okay. The parents need to support, but they need to let the student athlete do the process themselves because, you know, at the end of the day, also on an honest point, coaches don't want headaches, you know, during the season or during the time that you know, the student athlete is there, you know, if you have a parent calling you every other day and, you know, either complaining or asking questions and stuff, you know, this can get in the way of the coaches. And again, the coach is ultimately trying to find their right recruit on their team. So parents just, you yeah. know, support and just be there. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's talk about what to include. What do you want to include in the email? Well, okay, first of all, um, you want to make sure that you include the whole entire coaching staff, as we said. So you write, you know, address it to one coach, maybe the head coach. It really doesn't matter. CC everyone else. And that now you got the entire coaching staff's eyes potentially on this email. The subject line, keep it short, sweet, a stat, your grad year, your name, so they know when when what year you're coming in and um, they, they can quickly determine how they can communicate with you with their recruiting rules. Um, and then the email, okay. Um, so we talked about personalizing it, but the profile. Okay, so again, tons of places where you can build player profiles um, that will give you all the information that a coach needs to evaluate you. That's what we've done um, and I'm recruitable. But if you're building a profile yourself as well, you gotta include you know, your contact information, you got to include your grad year, your enrollment, um, you got to include all your key stats about your sports, your results, your academics, your unofficial transcripts, your test scores, reports. There's a ton of information that you need to give these college coaches in order for them to evaluate you because that's what they're going to do in the email is read a short paragraph of why you want to be at that school and your personal statement, but you're not telling them your story. So you're just telling them, hey, I'm interested, here's why, check out my profile. And a video has to be in there. A highlight video must be in there. Um, those are the key things. So if a coach, let's just recap that, if a coach is evaluating a player, they wanna see a video. They wanna know when you're gonna graduate and when you're gonna enroll in school. They want to know what your grades are. They want to see what classes you've been taking up until now. So grade nine to current transcripts, unofficial. Send that in the email. You can also you also want to include your test scores. If you've taken the ACT or the SAT, or if you're an international student, the TOEFL. Include those PDF results so they don't just read it, they see it. Um, what major you want to study. If you know what you want to study, the coach can tell you whether they offer that or not and give you some information about it. Your results and key stats, as far as, um, you know, if you play in a league, your, 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 your club team results, your personal stats, any info and all information that's current, you know, dated, you don't wanna send them stuff that you did three years ago. You wanna give them current stuff and then they'll search you and figure it out. From there, you've gotta make sure you keep it short. Keep it short in your messaging because if you if a college coach receives a one-page, two-page email, what are they going to do, John? Are they going to read it or not? Probably back, not. When back they have, to the X. Uh, you know, when they have a hundred emails to look at. So probably. you got to treat a coach like a CEO of a company, right? And a CEO of a company is going to read headlines and they're going to quickly sit through and want the beef of the message. And a coach initially to determine whether you're a prospect or not, they're going to have their two piles right here. So yes or no. Now they're only going to deem you a no when they, when it's later in the recruitment process and they know for sure they can't help you. And that would be some trigger points like, uh, you know, you need a full scholarship or you can't afford anything and it's a division three school and they don't offer scholarships or uh, they don't have you know, you want to study engineering and there's no engineering department or anything remotely close to engineering, then they might say, hey, we don't offer this. You probably should right. go somewhere else. But other than that, you can might go into the interested pile and a, become a potential prospect. But the only way they can do that is if they know that you fit the minimum requirements of what their school requires academically and athletically. And the only way well, to give that to coaches is by giving them a profile that they can evaluate. And that's the biggest mistake players make and why they often do not get a response back or the response they're looking for from coaches. Well, one of the biggest factors too is the, like the academic side. So when it comes to test scores and academics, you know very well that a lot of these schools, you need to pass their admissions process before you can even get on their team so some of these you know higher division three academic schools or your ivy leagues like they have you know specific you know test scores or grades gpas that you need to actually be able to attend the school so you know that's 
that's a very important thing for those type of schools as well. And when it comes to the athletic ability, I mean, they'll know right away, right? I mean, if you're, you know, trying to go to a complete out of reach school, you know, I mean, you got to do your research on that part, right? I mean, you can't just be going to your top 20 division one schools when, you know, yeah, when you're not and, at that and, level. So, and by the way, like another tip for, for everyone is that like, if you're on track to getting to a school's level, but you're not there yet, a coach is not going to write you off. Right. No. So like, that's some that that that's where like you know we're talking about giving them the information your grades your test scores all that stuff it's like a lot of people don't want to give that until they feel like they have the result that's guaranteeing to get them in and oftentimes it can they don't even know what that is they just kind of guess it or they heard from a past player or a kid oh this is what i got this is what you need to get and it's like no no just give the coaches the information you have that's current. If you have right. a 3.5 GPA and the coach says you need a 3.7, like you're 0.2 off, you can probably make it happen, provided you contact these coaches earlier. So when you contact- Well, exactly. Well, yeah. So, yeah. so like provided you contact them earlier, again, what we were talking about before is staying on their radar, right? So if you contact a coach, you know, in grade 10, you know, you have this type of test score, you're at this level, and then all of a sudden you're going into your- you know, your um, junior year, all of a sudden your GPA has went up, you know, your, your level has gone up, you know, no matter which sport you're in, a coach can see that and, and they appreciate the progress that you're making and the strides that you're making to get to their specific program, let's say. Right. I've, I've seen it this way. I've seen athletes that have contacted coaches when the contact period starts in junior year. Um, and coach says to them, well, you need to have this results and this athletic ability. Well, great. The kid goes to town, they work their butt off, they get to that level. Hey coach, I'm here now. Sweet. You're part of my potential recruits now. Yep. That and, all that. and I've seen it the other way around, contacting the coach, finally giving the coach the test scores and the information they were asking for a year ago, finally getting to them during senior year when it's coming down to crunch time and then coach saying, well, I need you to be here, here, and here. Crap, I wish I knew that a year ago because I would have actually had something to work towards. But instead I kind of hid behind, you know, put, getting a no and just, you know, was fearful of that rather than getting the constructive feedback of, yes, you, you can, you might be able to make it if you do this and having the opportunity to do so. Everybody just wants to have an opportunity. And that's why you just got to start early. How many times do we also hear, you know, even with these platforms or, you know, kids, you know, giving out their resumes or profiles and, you know, they don't want to include specific results or scores because they're scared that, you know, it's going to shy away from the coaches. Well, it's not like they're not going to shy away. If you're a sophomore putting in your scores, the coach obviously knows that you still have a couple years to improve both athletically and academically. So you, you have to always put in your information there. Coaches are going to have you on the radar. They're going, they're going to keep looking at your information and see your improvement. And that's where you have to, you know, keep in contact with the coaches, engage with them, ask them, what do I need to get to your program to play on your team? What do I require academically? And what level do I need to be at? And that way you have an understanding of what it takes to get somewhere where you want to be. Makes a lot of sense. And uh, that, let's go into the responding to interest from coaches. So the opposite side, and you touched on it earlier. Right. But, um, you know, usually players are getting interest from coaches that they're not necessarily – interested in the schools that's right. usually the way it works right um for for a majority of these athletes because everybody's trying it like there's no secret everybody's trying to get to the best schools in the country the, the names that we all know of course everybody wants to play there and somebody some people fall somewhere in between there and get comfortable with that and um that includes ourselves right you right. know we did not play at any big time school uh, we may have dreamed and wanted to go there, but I think that gives us 
that ability to to help a little bit more in the sense of like I know where most players are at. Like we all hit up the Dukes of the world and the Stanfords and et cetera. We all do that, UCLA's and whatnot. I tried to be um, a Tar Heel. There you go. So, but but the thing is that if it's not going to happen, you're going to get hit up by a lot of coaches um, that show interest in you. The worst mistake right. that athletes make is they write those coaches off by, as you said, not responding to them or not giving them the time of day when really some of those schools may turn around at, eventually at some point and become your legitimate options. Do your research. You could have, you know, you could have your eyes set on division one. Okay. You have a division two coach that's contacting you. Do your research. You do your research. You, you're also going to find out, okay, well, this is actually like a top division two school that can actually beat this division one school that's interested in me. You just have to do your research. And again, stay engaged, keep in touch with the coaches because you should always have your, you know, your safety schools, your fit schools and, and the dream schools to go after. We understand you have certain dreams, but you also have to do your research because where you're going to end up going or where you should be going is the right fit, both academically and athletically. And again, you just got to, you know, keep the respect going with the coaches. If there's truly legitimate, no interest in going to a school for whatever reason, it could be, you know, too far away from you and you definitely know you're not going to be going to the state let's say just you know respond to them let them know like look unfortunately i'm not going to be attending there it's a little too far for me i want to be closer to my family whatever the case is it just you know stay in communication with them they'll appreciate that and they can always pass your name on to other coaches all right exactly and maybe one of the mistakes people make in that process is also making those decisions early on Right. Like, um, like, like it's legit what you just said, like there is a legit chance that, um, that, that you may not want to go to a specific state or be too far away. And that would be your decision throughout your entire recruitment process. But I also see the opposite side. A lot of athletes that go, well, I want to stay in uh, California. I want to stay in Florida. I want to go to school in the Northeast. And then as they evolve, grow, they start saying, well, I wouldn't mind going here or there. How many times do you hear of the kids? that want to go to specific areas and then decide later on. No. So I wouldn't, unless you're absolutely 100% sure. And that usually happens in late junior year, beginning of senior year. If it gets to that point that you know exactly where you're not going to go or what you're not going to do or what you're not going to study, then you make those decisions until then you stay in contact with those coaches the same way they're going to be interested in you. A coach is not going to write you off and say, I'm not interested. They're going to keep you on their radar and string you along. So you also have to keep those coaches um, interested in you and keep every door possible open to as, for as long as you can. Yeah. Cause when it boils down to it, what, what, what happens in the end, what happened to me, I'm from Canada. Okay. I, had no idea I was going to end up in New Mexico, small town in New Mexico. But guess what? I went on my recruiting trip there, had a great time, got to see the school, the campus, and had the best four years of my life. So just like you were saying, you know, let's say you're a kid from California, you just want to stay on the West Coast. You end up taking a recruiting trip out to Missouri. Boom. Guess what? You just found your school that you're going to be attending for four years because you had such a good experience there. You met the people, the coaches, the team, and you know, that ends up being the winner. Yeah. And you, you know, my story, right? It's like, um, I actually decided I wasn't going to come to the States. I enrolled in school at McGill in Montreal. I got the call in June after I graduated mm -hmm. and whatever, for whatever reason, I decided to go to my dad after I got off the call. And I just said, what do you think? And for like, six months i was like no i'm not going you know after i went through the whole recruiting trips even committed to a school in the states then decommitted type of thing like mm -hmm. and you know and then decided to go home got that phone call late june decided to go next thing you know i'm in new mexico too and it's like don't look back so you make you know you make decisions when you, you know, as best you can, but at the same time, you don't over try to over 
um, commit or or not commit enough. Like it's it, you're changing so much during your high school years. You really don't know where your mind's taking you. And so in my case, all of a sudden, I don't know where it came from. I honestly don't know which day it happened, how it happened. It was that coach's call. And I was just like, what am I doing? I've been training all my life. I'm missing out on this opportunity. You found and out I, I was there. Yeah. There you, you found go. out I was in New Mexico <laughs> no and, and you wanted to come. I understand that. Probably the reason why I wanted to leave. <laughs> yes. um, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, th there's so many, and in, there's so many instances like that. And that's why like we can speak from experience. Not only do we have our own experiences, but we have our, you know, uh, friends that, that were our teammates and other athletes. And then we have all the people we saw and all the people that we've been in touch with over the years. It's like, that, that's just the honest truth. How many, you know, if you actually go through it, people change their mind several times. So what you need to just make sure you, uh, you don't, you know, uh, put yourself in a position where a coach is going to say, okay, well put that person off my list. And then you lose that option. Never, never count out schools again, just because you get an email from a coach and you've never heard of the school before the name doesn't cross you know, you don't know where it's coming from. Just don't don't count them out. Always, again, my, my biggest takeaway from this is always do your research. Research, see where the school is, um, you know, see where their athletic level is, academic level, see if your major is there. Again, you're trying to find the best fit school. So do your research. All right, so let's finish off here by talking about what you're trying to get out of this first contact. And, um, you know, everything comes together there. It's finding the fit, like you said. So in the first contact, you're trying to make, get into one pile or the other, whether you're on track to meeting the school's requirements and being a potential recruit, right. or you're immediately a potential recruit for that coach, or you're deep into the process, um, you're going into your senior year or you're in your senior year, whatever it is. And like, you just, you're not going to make the cut for that team. So let's just find the right school, you know, whatever right. situation you're in, you're trying to find that out first and foremost. Mm -hmm. After that, you're trying to figure out if this school is some, a school that you want to continue to pursue. And um, you know, that initial contact with that coach if they're interested and you're interested, then you can get on that co phone call or send those text messages to each other and get, start to get to know each other. Right. And if you start to get to know each other, you listen to what the coach offers, what the school offers, what the coaching styles like, what the players are like, what the teams like as uh, you know, in terms of their goals and what they want to do with the program and how you're going to help them. And then what you can get academically out of the school and of course, it's also important to know what type of money is there. You know, we, we often forget to talk about the financial side because, um, you know, nobody wants to bring up, hey, coach, I want a scholarship. Hey, I can only afford this or whatever it is. But I believe, I truly believe that that's part of the initial conversation you are having. There's just a way to do it is that if you're, if you're only have a certain amount of money that you can put towards college, and there's a ceiling there. And I urge parents to sit down early on and do some college planning is sit down as early as possible and reevaluate every so often and say, look, you know, if my son or daughter found the best university for them and it was a good school that we also approve of and all that stuff, I'm willing to spend up to this amount of money. All right. Have that there. I'm get a budget. Get a bu exactly, but the budget has to be more than just I want to spend this much. Right. What you want to spend and what you have to spend are going to be two different things, right? And so, knowing what you would you're able to spend if and when needed should be written down, right? What you want to spend, you can certainly write down, but remember the coaches are the market and the market will dictate how much you're worth. And it depends on where you're going and what you're doing. And th that's another topic of discussion. But having that information there will also determine for the athlete, and this is where parents, you can help, whether you're not, it's, an, it's realistic to seek that school out or not. So if you get a coach who says, look, we don't have 
scholarships. We're division three, but we have academic scholarship that you could qualify for, or you would not qualify for anything. And based on your income, you wouldn't qualify for any aid. It costs $60,000 a year to go to school here. If that is not something you can ever entertain, then why are you even wasting your time and the coach's time? Just right. you got to move on from that school. But if it's something that you can entertain, then certainly see it through. There's just a way to approach it that I believe comes off to the coach as you're not just looking for money. It's more of saying, hey, coach, here's my athletic resume. Here's my academic resume. And here's my financial resume. And don't try to lowball coaches or make ridiculous budgets. Like parents, I know you guys, are, some, some people are going to think, you know, I can, uh, you know, let, it's a negotiation battle. This is a sales thing. Yes, in some way it can be. But for the most part, coaches have budgets. There are certain things involved. So just, you know, it, if a coach is going to, just because you tell a coach that you might have a $60,000 a year budget that you'd be willing and able to spend doesn't mean you're going to spend that money. Right. So coaches also are going, if you're an athlete and you have scholarships, they're also going to offer you something that is fair mm -hmm. and competitive to what other schools are offering. So just because they may know you have a budget of up to 60000 to spend doesn't mean they're going to offer you nothing. They're all going to realize that other schools are going to offer you something. So they also have to offer you something and compete. Right. Um, so it's really important. That's, I believe, you're trying to get that out of the first not the first contact, but the first set of communication that you're having is at least understanding <clears throat> the financial aspect of that college to make sure it's in line with your budgets so that you don't start barking up the wrong tree. Agreed. Awesome. Anything else, Johnny? No, I think uh, we're, we're good on all those notes. Awesome. Okay, guys. Well, thanks for tuning in to episode one. Um, we appreciate you guys listening in. We'd love to get comments, feedback, and other, you know, uh, questions so we can include them in our topics of discussion and, uh, mm -hmm. we'll see you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.